Hello guys. Uh, this marks the second in the series I'm doing, hopefully all this month, on explaining different parts of autism, especially the less talked about sides of it. Um, as I said last time, I'm going to be touching on why some autistic individuals are nonverbal and why even among the verbal autistic, they seem to communicate less and even parts of how they vocalize seems to be different. Um, I know I've spent enough comments in my, uh, in my channel about that. I'm aware of it. I can't do much about it. Um, this will be explaining why. So if you didn't know, roughly a third of autistic individuals are nonverbal. Um, even among the verbal autistic, they tend to communicate less. Uh, this partially manifests as it's just socializing less, although there's many reasons why that's the case, but that is part of it. Uh, speech pathologists have been noticing this for a while, and for several decades, uh, the idea was, oh, well, they just don't know that they're supposed to socialize. And we sort of talked about that in the last video, and now that's probably not the case. And it's not the case. Um, one of the fantastic things that more modern technology has provided is the ability to type, because you don't need fine motor control to do that. And so uh, individuals like one I mentioned last time with Carly Fleischmann, who is believed to not even be able to communicate and not understand the people around her, can type, communicate that way, and um, sort of shock the parents because they had been speaking as if in front of her as if she wasn't there and totally aware of everything. Um, this started getting people to look at things differently. And what some speech pathologists started to notice is that if you carefully write down the exact phonemes that are being produced, they're biased in particular directions. So especially with the like the semi-verbal, it, it's not really a good name for it, but the individuals who are able to produce vocalizations, but they're not the complex, sophisticated stuff that we call language. Um, you notice patterns, and it's specifically biased towards vowels and what are called plosives, which are a specific type of consonant. Uh, if you're a little uncertain what a plosive is, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but p for the beginning of plosive is a plosive, that kind of more forced, there's not really nuance to it, or like with a lot of other consonants. This got them thinking. And if you are a speech therapist or speech pathologist, you might already be on the right track after I had just said that. This got them thinking, are there structural or motor differences in autism. Another one of the things that sort of got them thinking this, and that I've been noticed for a while anyways, is that there is altered prosody, and that is a specific part of speech um, dealing with sort of the overall flow of the speech. Uh, if you pay attention, and you're going to be now that I'm going to mention this, um, like my, my speech, there tends to be much more emphasized pauses a lot of the time, and after there is a pause, the very next vocalization is more emphasized. This is the altered prosody finding. So this got them, especially more recently, starting to look into what is going on here. There's clearly differences that we can identify. Why? One of the techniques for doing so was to take recordings and analyze the waveform that resulted, as well as to do imaging of the throat while the individual was
was talking. Uh, there are a lot of studies involving this. I'm not going to talk about every single one because that's going to be horribly boring, but I've got four that I just want to mention. Um, the first is on from a Yasuhiro Kakihara and others, and the findings, because I'm not going to bore you with the specific numbers and metrics and all of that, was that there tended to be a noticeable elevation in pitch and difficulty starting the vocalization, but not carrying through the rest of the vocalization. So this was actuation at the very beginning, but once you got speaking, it was largely fine. They suspected that this was probably lip strain, that the difficulty getting the lips to move uh, at first. Another study that looked at it in a different way was by Ahijit Mohanta. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I almost certainly did. Um, the findings there was that there was a higher vocal fold vibration, so the you know, part of the throat vibrated more rapidly than it would normally. This is obviously going to change how you speak. Uh, that it took more effort to vocalize, that this was not just in the lips, but throughout the entire throat. There was a very impulse-like excitation, so it, it, there was a strain to get the vocalization at first, and then when it happened, it was very sudden, jerky kind of movement. And they also noticed a structural difference in a the um, pharyngeal oral tract, the, the vocal tract, uh, was shortened, and this would be because the pharyngeal muscles aren't constricting as much, um, which sort of ties into the other muscle issues that I've been describing. Um, Yao Santos, which I probably butchered as well, I'm sorry, uh, didn't have any novel findings as far as what was going on, but took many of the models that were already being done and tried applying them to much younger ages than they were already done, and was able to find that you can start to identify these differences as early as 18 months old. Um, then a more comprehensive study was done by D.K. Aller and others, where they just looked at taking a bunch of these techniques and validating their accuracy, so holding them up under much higher scrutiny than was originally done. So no new findings again, but verified that the models in fact work. Uh, overall, uh, these are surprisingly accurate, for, given that it's something that's basically never talked about as far as autism goes, in that you can correctly identify whether the person is autistic or not based on a vocal sample. Uh, anywhere between like 84 to 97 percent accuracy which is phenomenal and you've probably noticed by the names that i've uh given this has been done in numerous different countries with essentially identical findings so this isn't local to this in the united states or some other country this seems to apply to autism in general um so a little summary of what the findings were, in that there are structural differences, like the shortened laryngeal tract, but more importantly is the motor differences, because these are actually the same motor differences that have been observed otherwise, that the impulse-like, the, the difficulty getting the muscles to start moving, and then when they do, it's a little too much, and you have to rein that in, that's observed throughout most of the skeletal muscles um, and even some of the non-skeletal muscles, which is fun. But when it comes down to nonverbal children, it's not that the autistic child doesn't know that they need to speak. It's not that they're being defiant or anything like that. It is quite literally that they can't get their muscles to move in the ways that are necessary to produce speech. So, you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but some things that I have found useful 
working in with other autistic individuals who are much more affected than I am, consider options like having them write down messages on a piece of paper or type them out on a computer. Uh, nearly everybody has phones or tablets nowadays, so it's very easy to do that. Uh, if that's something that they're able to do, and it seems like that's one of the easier options, then that would be a fantastic way to still be able to communicate. This, that's important. There's still a person there. It's just that their muscles aren't working right. And they still have preferences on things. All of that. I, I, I see a lot of the time, I just assume that person's not speaking, they're, they're, they're too far gone, just gonna, you know, we're out eating and just gonna order them whatever they want, and they're gonna be able to tell you, maybe not through vocalizations, but they're, they're gonna be able to tell you. Um, other techniques that, and this sort of applies more generally too, is sometimes little picture cards uh, can be very helpful. Uh, you have to have the cards for every single possible setting, which gets a little tedious, um, just given the how much we have phones and tablets and everything nowadays, that would be probably the best option to go about it. Um, still communicate with your kid, which is fantastic. I obviously appreciate that too. Uh, hopefully that has been very insightful. I sort of explained what is actually going on there. Um, or at least what we think. Uh, there's some other explanations for why that might be the case. Um, and I will be touching up on that next time because there's another side of the vocalization and hearing. Um, dealing with some neurological differences found in the temporal parietal junction, specifically Wernicke's area, which deals with speech processing, and Broca's area, which deals with producing speech. So uh, there's other findings with uh, temporal parietal junction as well, which are highly relevant to autism. But uh, yeah, until then, have a good one, guys.